Um, I am Ailes McFarlane. I'm Policy and Advocacy Officer at BEFS, the Built Environment Forum Scotland. Um, and I'm very glad you could all make it here today because I know there are quite a few other tempting sessions going on at the same time. And I'm very pleased to welcome our panel, Fiona, Gavin, Linda and Robin, who you know, will be uh, telling you about their own experience. I can say that their careers demonstrate a huge range of experience within communities. There are award-winning projects that, that they have, have worked on and they've been working within community projects but also working for national and advisory organisations, all of which have such an important part to play in community heritage. And whilst it's, it's my role to ask questions and to provoke and to find out what future skills mean for you and to you, um, I'll, I'll just talk a little bit about where my journey in this process started. Um, until relatively recently, when I moved to Beths, I've very much been in uh, skills and skills focused roles. Um, I was project manager for the HLF Skills for the Future traineeship programme, Heritage Horizons. This was based at Museums Gallery Scotland. And I think Loretta will be talking to you tomorrow about community engagement. At, um, at MGS, I, I was working with museums across the sector to help them deliver the first non-graduate year-long traineeship program that had a vocational skills qualification and it has um, the first sector specific museums and galleries SB, SBQ. And through that, I really, I was very privileged to see the development in knowledge and skills and understanding that took place, not just from the trainees, but from all the individuals who are involved. Um, trainees are now working in a wide variety of roles across the sector and um, I can heartily recommend Ken McElroy's talk tomorrow where he will share his knowledge and passion for all things Baroque. Um, it's, it's usually very entertaining, um, possibly too entertaining, but that was only when I had to manage him. Um, <laughs> I, um, I was then fortunate enough to be project manager at HLF Catalyst Funded. I think you can see a theme here. Um, at Resourcing Scotland's Heritage uh, whilst Louise Downing was on maternity leave and I hope that anybody who wanted to or needed to got to see um, her lunchtime workshop. That's a unique partnership programme that really covers the breadth of the heritage sector. It's led by Arts and Business Scotland, the partners at Archaeology Scotland, Beths, Green Space Scotland and Museums Gallery Scotland. It, it provides a, a very different model for the sector in that it delivers fundraising training to upskill the sector and to build capacity in finding funding from private sources rather than looking at statutory funding. During that role, I really saw the sharp end of the heritage sector from small, entirely volunteer-run organisations delighted to find sources of training to help them start or, or maybe develop their, their journey, but really struggling to raise money to deliver a project that they know is of value to their community. But also large national organisations dealing with risk-averse boards and the knowledge that their statutory funding is likely to decrease, but still in the process of forming their own strategic direction to replace that funding. Each had so much to learn from each other. The small organisations were astonished, but delighted to discover it wasn't just them, it wasn't just being small and volunteer that sometimes made it tricky. And the larger organisations really got to see new ways of working and how managed risk and more innovative choices because they had, they had the freedom to make those decisions could provide great benefit. But the core of each project or organisation that came was always the same. It was the knowledge that heritage matters and that its value is far greater than just what sits on a balance sheet. Delivering skills-based programmes, um, it led to a very specific opportunity, um, working on the Voices of Culture, which is a dialogue between the European Commission and the heritage <coughs> sector. The paper is Skills Training and Knowledge Transfer in Traditional and Emerging Heritage, so you know, the kind of snappy title that you would completely expect from these things. And I'm going to talk just for a few minutes about this today because it's, it gives an idea of some of the bigger picture thinking around skills that is happening across, across the breadth of the sector in Europe. I will add the caveat, this is hugely abridged and I have tried to keep the information as relevant to community heritage as possible. It's, it's a massive project that covers 
a very, very wide number of policy areas. So there will be things for everyone, but just try to narrow it down a bit. Um, I will say that we look very, very happy in that photograph. That's because we haven't just spent three hours heatedly debating definitions of heritage <laughs> or professional, which I think you can imagine when you get people who very much care in a room, that did take up some time. The process itself was instigated um, in 2014 when the European Commission released a paper dealing with the challenges to cultural heritage, talking principally about destruction, decline and digital shift. Those were the three, the three main categories. And there was acknowledgement of the need to meet these challenges and to learn to innovate, to negotiate and to really embrace societal and economic changes taking place across Europe. I will not go into the process itself in any detail, but I'm very happy if anybody wants to ask me any questions later after the session. Um, in terms of who was involved, you can see it was a very wide number of organisations and countries. Um, and skills um, were discussed from a number of perspectives, but eventually it was decided that there were four main stakeholder groups. And I would say that crossover is expected and encouraged between these groups, but it was narrowed down to policy makers and policy making, heritage mediation, which was very much seen as those involved with communication, engagement, advocacy, bringing resources together and managing and planning for opportunities within the sector. Heritage expertise, which is very much what you'd expect, the traditional and emerging professional roles, heritage identification, recognition, conservation, archival skills, archaeological skills, and also those giving recommendations around standard and ethics. And most importantly for today, the, the fourth group was seen as, as the public, communities, participants, and future participants. All of those who are involved in the dialogue process said that they, they can't be seen as a group that are external with which to engage. They are very much agents within the sector they themselves and their involvement broadens awareness of the enjoyment that heritage brings. It brings awareness of the importance of protecting and preserving heritage. And there is also an increased expectation to engage with policy and heritage mediation. Um, as to why the European Commission are talking about skills now, well, part of the impetus is related to the European Year of Cultural Heritage, and during which time the directorates at, at the Commission are able to champion and launch projects and to demonstrate what skills are necessary for the long-term health of the sector. I very much recommend that any project interested in being part of the European Year has a look at the British website. Um, there is no funding associated with the year, that's the bad news. The good news is that it's free to register. <laughs> so, you know, it might not cost you anything. But I will say that it's a chance to promote what you do on a bigger stage and it's, it has the potential to demonstrate that the knowledge, the research and the skills associated with heritage are not necessarily bound by geographical and political constructs. All of the recommendations within the paper were aligned to the four pillars of the year, sustainability, engagement, protection and innovation. And this was to make sure that the policy makers themselves could hang the ideas onto something concrete and really had something something to work with. Um, with they, they only met on the 25th of October to discuss the paper, so I don't know what the outcomes will be yet, but I've, I've taken, I've taken the, the recommendations that I know have, have been discussed. Many of the recommendations themselves are directly relevant to communities and community projects, and many aspects we'll end up talking about during the discussion session. The paper itself had several sections. I'm really only going to highlight a few. Um, but one of which was quite important, was talking about the power of cultural heritage and how to skill the sector to talk about that. And, and the way that we dealt with it as a group was we knew we were preaching to the converted. We knew everybody in the room cared about heritage, thought it was important, saw the value. So we were trying to make sure that the skills we were talking about challenged the negative assumptions. that heritage is expensive, it's alienating, it's elitist, it's obsolete and it's a barrier to change and development. And then we talked about um, mapping the missions or the roles within cultural heritage. This was to try and talk about the diversity of, of roles involved, that there are specialist skills, but there are so many other, other roles within heritage. I'm going to show you this with some 
Yeah, this is just a little example of the mapping. There were several pages of this, and, and whilst you can see that these diagrams have been designed by detailed heritage professionals, not designers, they have proved extremely useful in showing the breadth and overlap across the sector, and to an extent they, they highlight skills gaps and training areas. I do not expect you to be able to see any detail, but if, if you have a look at the paper, you can see all, all the detail. And one of the final things that, that was discussed but seen as core was dealing with transversal competencies. These are not sitting directly within heritage specialisms, but they are skills that are necessary for the sector to flourish. Communication and advocacy, knowledge transfer, financial competence, strategic planning and thinking, digital competence, prospective thinking, and obviously, very importantly, shared stewardship. I mean, when it came to um, relevant recommendations, the Commission tentatively agreed that, that the mapping of the roles was important, particularly because it helped to identify and strengthen the strategic skills, and it helped to show the essential economic and social role that cultural heritage has, emphasising its role as a common good. But there were also skills relating to young people, volunteer development, particularly increasing public participation, community participation, and training within that area for communities. And also the recommendation of a, a formal recognition scheme for volunteering across Europe. And skills relating to strategic capacity building, something that, that was talked about a lot was the T-shaped individual with a fantastic depth of heritage expertise, but a broad range of competencies. Skills relating to building strong partnerships, something that is just so important in every project that I know people will be dealing with here and also dealing with the knowledge capture from traditional skills and crafts, because these, these could be lost both as a means of preserving heritage, but also as a, within their own right, within intangible cultural heritage. And I, I appreciate I've taken some time to discuss this, and what I hope is that you're looking at the slide and thinking, but we do that. Our community experiences do demonstrate an integrated approach. They are cross-disciplinary. They do bring in volunteers from across ranges of skills and experience. We do work with different colleagues across many organisations. Because so much of, of what is discussed when it comes to skills is knowing and appreciating what's best practice, but then having the skills to put it into action and the time and the funding, those can sometimes be the greater barriers. And I hope that the questions we'll go on to discuss today will maybe eliminate some of the challenges and some of the successes that, uh, that the sector deals with, hoping to find a really robust future. And that's all from me, so I'm now going to welcome up Fiona to say a few words to introduce herself. Hello. Are we not going to sit from here? Well, we will. Or we'll. We will, but in a minute. <laughs> what, one at a time first. <laughs> right. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, I'm, so my name's Fiona Jackson, and um, I'm in, involved in um, helping to run a, a community heritage project in my community, and I do some other things too, which I'll explain, but my skills angle, um, or I'm not a professional in, in skills in any way, shape, or form, nor am I a professional in cultural heritage or archaeology or anything like that, um, but I thought I'd just explain some of the stuff that I've done and where I see it fitting and then hopefully um, everybody else will do their bit and then we can talk. Um, I'll be scribbling some stuff. So the where, where I got involved in it initially was um, as, as part of this project that we were doing what we talked about at the beginning of the conference um, and I just I, I kind of quickly sort of jotted down some of the, the stuff. Where, where we came from it in terms of skills was that we f we talk to the people in our community around the, the cultural heritage or the skills that they felt that they were interested in and then we basically identified what they were and we set up lots and lots of workshops to respond to the, to the people what people were interested in and when I started actually writing down all of the things that we that, that people started being interested in it's quite an interesting sort of a, array of of, um, of, of of topics and we decided that we needed to um, get the, pe the experts in to tell us about them. So things like um, use of maps and plans, 
So oh, we've got, oh, in fact, we've got Eve to come in and do a work, day's workshop on that. Um, we did some stuff on archiving and, and how you use libraries and, and, and the Arkham's archive at the time. Did some aerial photographs. So Heather and Northlight did some, some stuff for, for our community on that. We did place names. People were saying they wanted to know about place names. We've got Simon Taylor from Glasgow University. You know, like, this was HLF funded, but all these people um, we paid their expenses, but they actually some of these people did it for free, which was really good, because um, that's where you know you have to use your wily ways to try and get things to happen. Um, we did some documentary and map resources, just looking at the whole general thing about online online access to the resources that a lot of our community, including me, I certainly didn't know about this stuff. So again, I think Heather Heather did that for us. Um, we did some GIS stuff that really did my head in but you know all the layers of work we got an open resource thing and Kathy McIver who now works for AOC did that for us as part of um, the project um, we did all the field work skills um, under the sun I think um, excavation geophysical surveying walkover saying digital surveying the RTI stuff so we have to remember this reflectance transformation imaging so um, uh, Clara Molina Sanchez don't know how to pronounce that properly but Clara came along and we suddenly the whole world of you know gravestones and stuff like that opened up to us and how you could actually see the patterns and, and, and etchings there um, plane table excavation dendrochronology. We got Coralie Mills in. Now we did pay her, actually. <laughs> she came in and we did some sort of like look, looking at trees and being able to, to work out the ages. Some paleontology, AOC, helped us with that again. You know, um, there was some payment there involved. So, but, you know, we had that money from HLF, so we were able to pay for some of these things. Um, so I found out, I found out what a Dutch gouge. Does anybody know what a Russian core and a Dutch gouger is? <laughs> I do now, and I, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a paleontologist in any way, right? Paleo-environmental skills, it was called. Then post-excavation, pottery. And then we started going into the, people were going, well, how, how you know, we're learning some of these things. How, how, do we, how do we promote this? How do we tell people about, the, about our cultural heritage in, in our community? So we did some stuff on um, website design, um, how to do graphic design and posters. And so it sort of started go, going to the more generic skills within communities. So we sort of did that cultural heritage um, skills and then went out a little bit into, well, we as an organization, how do we then start sharing this and getting the skills up there? Um, the interpretation, I mean, I brought it along here, but we, we did, you know, a lot of people are into the sort of, you know, mapping graveyards, and we just did this, we, we sort of, with the help of Northlight, we, we mapped the, the graveyard, um, uh, at a little place called Ballyhennan, and then we got our website designer, who we don't pay a lot for, 70 quid a month, um, a year, sorry, 70 quid a year to service, and he um, connected, you know, so photographs and all of the history and information about each of those gravestones, and so on our website, people can link to those things. We work with St Andrews University Open Virtual Worlds, and we got a, 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 a map, uh, an app, and so we did some of that stuff for our heritage trail. So we started sort of like just going out a little bit in terms of the interpretation. Um, it was after that that then my, um, I think, I, I'm kind of an example of all of this actually, because I was not working at the time. I'd taken time off um, as a, as a, as a mum. I'd been working in sort of health and social care policy before that. Had 15 years of doing nothing, lost some brain cells, did some of this stuff. And then um, I actually ended up getting a job, um, basically off the back of some of this activity. Um, so I'm kind of, I, I was, a, 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 you know, I was really taken forward and progressed my career um, because of it. And so, and I started um, working for, so my other hat is I work now in community development for the National Park Authority at Loch Lomond and the Trossachs. And that then starts going into all the sort of DTAS stuff, all of the, you know, it's constantly coming up around skills in project management, procurement, um, what else, um, marketing. That's one of our big ones. A lot of the community organisations um, are just constantly saying, you know, how do, how do we do a brief for a graphic design proposal, for interpretation boards, or for an app, or, you know, and our communities in, in our rural area, they're really quite small, and they haven't done a lot of this. 
And I think we sometimes forget with all of this Empowerment Act and strengthening communities and, and, and island buyouts that all of the voluntary sector is like a capably empowered organisations and, and they're just not in our area. There's, there's very few actually and we're really going back to basics and we need help with details to come in and, and help us um, um, you know, um, build that capacity. Governance, big, big issue around for organisations as well as like financial um, management and, 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 um, and stuff like that and social enterprise, the sustainability thing, that's the big nut to crack I'm finding um, in terms of enabling communities to, to be empowered to actually sustain some of this stuff moving on from the project area. Um, and then I suppose, so that sort of, we went from community and cultural heritage and it's gone out to more of the generic issues around community organisations and running and the, the skills that are needed for doing that. Um, and then so one of my other sort of bits of work that I, I did was with uh, an organisation called the Skills Partnership. Um, and I just, I'm no expert and uh, it was really more, it was, it was, um, people skills that they needed and that was working with businesses um, in and around the national park um, and that was where I delved into the whole kind of skills development Scotland offer, modern apprenticeships, accreditation, linking employers to young people and the reasoning behind that was you know depopulation of our rural communities and then you sort of think about thriving communities, the economic generation. So that's the sort of the roller coaster road of skills that I've been on. I've probably not really said very much or helped you in, in, in any way, but hopefully if people want to come and talk about it, I can, I can talk from a, a personal perspective. Um, that was probably a little bit of a, a personal perspective of that kind of nightmarish logic map thing <laughs> that you showed. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm a bit of a, an example of some of all that stuff happening and the skills landscape I find really complicated and um, we are grappling at the National Park Authority at the moment with a skills action plan uh, because we have four local authorities and all of the data sets and all of our you know, data zones don't match up and so without an evidence base we're having great difficulty deciding where the gaps are and how we can actually respond so you know there's a you know so many different levels and I find it mind-blowing so that was a probably a confused mishmash but there you go. <laughs> and I've got examples of some of the stuff we did on here, if people want to look at it afterwards. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to move straight on to this. Yeah. Because I was, I was asked at the beginning, what happens when people take too long? And then I took too long. Yeah. <laughs> I just followed. Yeah. Can you take like three minutes? Gary? Nobody was watching the time. Probably not. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, I know quite a few people in the room. Um, and I suppose... What I want to do is wave an introduction, just reflect on that kind of journey I've been on as well, because I suppose um, looking back, um, the range of skills that we're talking about and the range of issues we're talking about, I couldn't have imagined uh, when I first graduated as an archaeologist. Uh, uh, 1992, I think, uh, don't tell anybody else. And the world I entered was a very different world. It was a world that was changing with, I think, you know, PPG and developer funded archaeology and I was very privileged to you know get the opportunity of a growing market and a growing second the planning policy guidance that was that allowing uh, or asking for polluter pace principle that uh, some of the archaeological work to be done takes place and to be honest it was really only through some of the work I was doing can you speak up? Sorry, okay? yeah, of course, Karen. <coughs> well, yeah. I'm quite happy. Sorry. Um, was that the implication that I got a really loud voice? No. Or you just didn't care what I said? You announced it. I've gone into internal reflection, the big one. <laughs> one of these. Can we see if they work? Actually, do you know what? I can speak if I just uh, stand up. It's the sitting thing, sorry. Um, yeah, so, so I emerged in the context. There was lots of developer funded archaeology. In parallel with that, though, there was uh, work that we were doing with the National Trust for Scotland. I was involved in training and skills development in a way I didn't even realise I was doing at the time through the National Trust for Scotland Thistle Camps, where volunteers, students, people from all over the world would be trained fairly rapidly and supported to go and investigate archaeological sites. And that was a very formative experience for myself and many, many colleagues. It wasn't until about 2005 that I run my first project that had community heritage in the title. 
And that was a very uh, powerful moment as well. It was the community at Lagan. It was the Strathmashie Strath Community Heritage Community Archaeology Project. And that was an initiative to record the new fee sites around the forest uh, as part of redevelopment of the woodlands um, to put mountain bike trails in in advance of Lagan uh, wolf tracks. So I had a real world encounter of how community interests were driving investigation. And I think that was a very important opportunity to understand, even at that time, uh, delivering other outcomes and delivering um, to other aspirations through community heritage was a very big part of this conversation, a very big part of these kind of relationships. And I suppose over the years when uh, I was lucky enough to be part of North Light Heritage and still am to the extent we, are, we, we, we started with an aspiration to support uh, communities in different ways and a lot of my experience has come through working with North Light Heritage and the range of projects that my, my colleagues run across Scotland in different ways. Um, and a lot of those in the first few years were very, as, as with working with you Fiona, in a sense it was hands on, providing some training support, hopefully those kind of conversations about accommodating the realities of budgets versus what you wanted to achieve and getting some fantastic results. But I found in increasingly recent years with North Lights practices, we're working with different communities now. We are not only working with communities of geography, um, you know, those communities who self-identify and who are quite capable of, you know, mobilising resource and, and, and learning and, and upskilling in different ways, but also communities of interest in, in various ways. And I think in terms of skills for the sector and for those communities, there's a very interesting conversation. Some of those communities of interest that we're working with now are actually uh, through partnerships with um, other organisations who have uh, user groups who, who actually got specific needs and who cannot access heritage in you know, the ways that we've been discussing up to this point, I think. So for me, I think in terms of skills and in terms of my journey, um, the sector is in a very different place. Looking back and reflecting over 20 years, that breadth of community heritage and that complexity of it, and the complexity, is, as you only, only so elegantly showed, the range of different activities we can do and the range of different audience segments or people that we may be able to help as well through that skills conversation for me has been a, a, a remarkably different place from 20 years ago. Thank you very much. I will use a mic actually if that's right. But, but not rock and roll one. Um, well, good, good afternoon. I'm Linda Gillespie and I'm from the Community Ownership Support Service at the Development Trust Association Scotland. I hadn't actually planned to see what my background was, but that may actually then influence just when you hear my talk, you'll see where my influences come from. My early career was in retail, and I worked for the Edinburgh Woolen Mill, um, ultimately running visitor, visitor centres for the Edinburgh Woolen Mill, so destinations. Went into local economic development and then moved into the social economy. So I am currently the programme manager for the Community Ownership Support Service. We are funded by the Scottish Government to support the sustainable transfer of assets into community ownership, and that's public assets into community ownership. It's an advisor-led service and we cover the whole of Scotland. Um, although we were set up ahead of the Community Empowerment Act, we have been operating since 2011. I think it's fair to say that the policy agenda in Scotland is, is changing significantly and basically aligning to support community ownership in, many, in its broadest sense. So you have the Community Empowerment Act, um, which went live in January, which gives communities of interest and communities of place the right to request the transfer of any public asset into community management, lease or ownership. They have the right to state how much they're prepared to pay for that asset and the presumption is in favour of communities unless there are very good grounds for refusal. So you have the Community Empowerment Act which also, also changed the community right to buy in that the community right to buy is now extended across urban Scotland. So the community right to buy is effectively a right of first refusal. So it's a preemptive right if an asset comes up for sale, and that can be public or private asset. You have new community rights coming on in terms of 
abandoned, neglected and detrimental land, which is likely to come into force in May next year, which is, a, a, there's compulsion associated with that. And I am sure that you will be working with groups that are very interested in this particular provision. And then there's the, the community right to buy for sustainable development, which is likely to will come in in 2019. This is public and private, and there's compulsion associated. Although I've just said public there, in reality, asset transfer requests should cover, in the hierarchy of rights, high, public assets should come out under asset transfer under the Community Rights of, uh, Community Empowerment Act. Um, in terms of our experience of communities coming forward, we don't have banks of communities that want to run community centres, public toilets, libraries. What we have is communities that are reacting to threat and opportunity, the threat of losing assets and services, um, and the opportunities that some assets bring. And, and heritage assets may form part of those assets of opportunity. But traditionally, the kind of opportunity assets tend to be things like caravan parks, car, car parks in urban Scotland. You know, highlands and islands are not missing a beat with coming forward for piers, harbours, marinas. Um, they just recognise the opportunities that those bring. Um, there is huge interest in communities round about historic assets, those totemic buildings that shape people's high streets. Um, and, and these particular assets galvanise huge levels of community support, both communities of interest and geographic communities. So 90% 90, 90 plus of the people in Campbelltown wanted Campbelltown Town Hall saved ask for what they were going to use the building for. And they were two years later, after significant feasibility studies and a lot of work and community consultation, they developed a, a business case that looks as if it's going to be sustainable. They, they attracted a million pounds plus money to redevelop the facility, and it's been opened as a community facility. So huge amounts of um, local support to sustain that building. And um, I think it's fair to say that where there is an established organisation in place. So for Campbelltown Town Hall, there was a South Kintyre Development Trust. So they have staff, they have roots into the community, they're quite clear about what the needs of those commu the community is. Um, and, in, and that is true of whether it's a heritage asset or any asset transfer. Where there's an established group, asset transfer is easier. It just is. So. Heritage assets actually galvanise a lot of support within communities, but quite often they are communities of interest that are coming round to save particular buildings. And where that's the case, it is just going to take longer. There's, there's all the kind of core group skills that need to be developed and capacity building and governance structures in place. And that just has to be accepted that this is a long, going to be a longer process if it's a new group that's coming together. Um, asset transfer is not easy. It just isn't. Um, there is an increasing number of, of heritage assets um, becoming available. Um, we are seeing um, a lot of churches at the moment are coming forward. Um, and people are just um, kind of trying to retrofit services into these types <coughs> of buildings. Um, and it is important. There isn't, there isn't enough money to support a repurposing of all the buildings that communities have an interest in. So it is important that people, communities are given support to rationalise their choices about what, you know, backing the winners, what, which one actually satisfies the needs of this community best um, and will deliver that because you, you're not necessarily going to be able to save them all or find uses for them. Um, you know, many of them are just liabilities rather than assets. And if you are not actually satisfying genuine needs in your community and you're retrofitting um, uses into these buildings, do you know, it's a hard road. It, it just is a, a hard road um, for kind of any community. And um, so I, what I would kind of say very clearly from the outset for communities is fundamentally what is the need? Leaving aside all the support for a particular asset or protection, what is the need in this community and does this building satisfy that need and um, if it doesn't you know if you're looking at a church because you think it would make a great art center and you can't remove the pews forget it. it might be the best church in the world might be the best building but if it's not going to functionally satisfy your needs just don't need it um, and then how is that building going to be sustained is 
Is that going to be visitors? Is it going to be service delivery? I don't believe that the solution for these buildings is community alone. They, some of them are, this is about partnerships, this is about public and private partnerships. Garrison House in Millport is owned by the community. North Ayrshire Council, Ayrshire Man and Health Board are both anchor tenants in that building and the community is able to kind of use that as a platform to kind of move forward. I fully accept that there are operational, quite challenging operational issues around about running heritage assets, particularly if you're talking about having open access to the public and it actually might be, there might be restrictions and conservation happening in other parts. I think that's potentially, that kind of operational side of things is something that kind of needs unpicked. But for me, and where we stand, and this is my time, big finish, <laughs> it's actually about sustainable revenue streams and driving what the enterprise model of that is. And if it can't be enterprising on its own, what other balancing assets or other revenue streams can be brought to bear to counterbalance where an asset may not actually be sustainable in its own right? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I don't know what anybody says that. Last but not least. Okay, you'll have to wave that much more. <laughs> um, right. Um, well, there's never been more opportunities for communities to learn about and uh, act on their heritage, is my glass half full beginning to this. <laughs> um, and I'm going to do the first bit on the glass half full and then have a look at the empty bit of the glass and, uh, and we'll see where we are. Um, I, I'll do it from my perspective within Historic Environment Scotland, which is to do with Serbian recording, but I'll also try and talk about the, the, the wider organisation. Um, looking at my history, I started in 1968. Oh my God, you're old. As a <laughs> As a, as a volunteer on a, a, a local day, and I never looked back uh, from there. Um, and from that point, I believed firmly and have tried to act on it that volunteers and communities were central to archaeology and the historic environment. Um, and the Scotland's Rural Past, Scotland's Urban Past, uh, and this conference is, is one of the ways that I've tried to help uh, others to uh, make that engagement. <coughs> um, I think that um, there are the, the beginning of communities being involved in heritage is about knowledge and understanding, and that's partly why my interest in survey and recording and, and seeing what there is and then understanding what there is and uh, leads on to everything else you need to do within um, any any activity of community to do with heritage, whether it's simply uh, stopping there and knowing or whether it's using that knowledge to establish significance, to look at the impact of any, any plans, to work out the practicalities of what can and can't be done, like the, the church pews. So the, the sort of um, Scotland's urban past, Scotland's rural past uh, type of activities that, that we've been hearing about today and, and those of the wider sector are, I believe, fundamental to the, the whole thing. And I think we've made good inroads to help enable communities to, to do that bit. Um, we do that passively and actively, and I would say that the Community Heritage Conference is a way that we are imparting information, but, uh, and slightly uh, 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 there's activity with, with community groups. Um, we have other sort of passive ways of transferring uh, information through things like CANBOR, the uh, Historic Environment Records, and um, past maps, and we're, we'll be looking a little at the digital shift. Um, and also providing learning resources which are, are constantly being created and, and updated and, uh, and soon to come and some exist already toolkits to help communities. And more active is, is how we go out and show people how to do things or help them to understand what the resources are available and organisations across Scotland do that from National Trust for Scotland, uh, uh, Scotland's Urban Past, uh, Archaeology Scotland, uh, archaeological contractors like North Light Heritage do that through excavation, through uh, getting people to monitor sites, to get people to record them and so on. Um, and things like the Landscape Partnerships and the Great Place Scheme that is currently being considered uh, are ways in which we can weave heritage and cultural heritage into communities like that. 
And, and beyond that, we are starting to do courses so that communities can come, community representatives can come and, and learn more formally uh, about some of the technicalities of, of how to do things. Well, that all sounds great. Um, the half-empty bit is um, it still can be quite top-down, and we've heard that um, about the bottom-up approach, but actually it's more the partnership. It's something in between. That there's a balance there that makes successful projects. I think it's still too exclusive. We look at the audience here. We have some people from um, some of the backgrounds uh, in the, uh, uh, the Equalities Act. We have very few people from uh, different socio-economic groups than the ABC1. Um, we've still got a lot of work to do there uh, on the basis that, that uh, cultural heritage is for everyone. Uh, and, uh, you heard from Alison uh, earlier today that that's one of the things, that, one of the nuts we're trying to crack in HES and with others. Um, there are new tools that are constantly coming through, uh, which we which we are trying to catch up with, and and then suddenly when we caught up with them, then they've moved on to something else, and you just need to look at uh, Twitter and Instagram and whatever comes next, uh, Snapchat, and you can tell I've got children uh, to, to see how that's happening. Um, and I think there's an intellectual inaccessibility that we need to get over as well. <coughs> if, they, if heritage is for everyone, then how do we make that happen and not have heritage just for uh, the educated um, middle class as, as has been the, in the past? And I think we are chipping away at that. And um, so there's this phrase, democratising heritage. It sounds trite. I think I'd like, to, I'd like it to happen. Exactly how it happens, we need to put a lot more thought into it. Um, but I do sense an increasing thirst from communities to be in, involved or to get other people to help them, um, to empower them to do what they want to do. Um, and, and you can see that across the board and with, with so many uh, community representatives uh, at this conference, you can see that there's a, a real spirit of that in Scotland. I would like to think, and in my experience, is that in HES, the, a relatively new organisation as such, um, you're pushing an open door if you want to get advice and help in this. And I know that the Community Empowerment Act has, has put massive obligations on the organisation, but nobody's saying, oh no, we can't do this. People are saying, how do we do this? How can we do this? And uh, I'm sure that we'll be asking that question of, of communities uh, as well, and not just thinking that we know better. Um, I hope that we'll hear how hard from the audience you want to push at, uh, at uh, releasing these resources. And just to finish, I, think, I do think community engagement in heritage has been around for a long time. It's very gradually coming to the mainstream, uh, too gradually for, for my liking. Um, and I think it's time, and I think that our Historic Environment Scotland Chief Executive, the board, the senior management team agree, it's time that our organisation stepped up here uh, and uh, helped to show others uh, what are the depth of our commitment to this. Thank you. The importance of digital shift of community heritage and, and the skills that are necessary for that. Now, you, you, you are very, you're holding, you're holding up digital I'm holding a really old fashioned nexus, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I know that you've worked with the Erica mobile app, mm. and can you tell us a bit about how, how that worked as a, as a community project and what was involved? Um, yeah, it was one of, um, one of these typical, um, it was an opportunistic thing. Actually, uh, you know, we kind of you know, being, being middle aged, um, we were, and having small children at the time, we were just like, okay, apps. What are these things then? You know, this is obviously you just like what are those other things? Um, those little barcode things. You know? QR. Yeah, QR. Apparently, they're not in anymore. I don't know. It kind of it just keeps shifting, isn't it? So we we thought, oh god, we need an app because everybody else is saying we need an app. Um, and we had developed our heritage trail, um, and it wasn't a new one. We piggybacked on a, an existing long distance trail and added heritage to it, um, which we thought was really clever, even though 
um, the sort of landowners and actually the national park at the time, because I wasn't working for them then, were saying, oh no, you need to make it you know, accessible to all disabilities and you need to put you know, 100 grand into this. And we were like, no, we just want to interpret the heritage um, along a trail that's already existing. So we kind of had the traditional leaflet thing, which we do actually, I just want to say, go against this a little bit and say, we need leaflets. Um, yeah. 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 There's no, you know, you ha it, it's the whole thing that we need an array of stuff. And there's a lot of people who don't want to use apps and the digital technology. There's a lot of people that do, obviously. So, you know, we had the leaflet. Um, we spent loads of money on HLF money on producing the leaflet. We had like, I think, 10,000 copies of it. And it went really, really quickly. And then we didn't have any way to fund a continued version of it. So we've, we're now doing something different, and we're going to, we've produced another one with a little bit of grant funding, not exactly the same, we're going to sell it. So we, we weren't thinking sustainability at the time, we were just like, oh, HLF is going to give us the money, and we'll just produce this beautiful leaflet. Um, we thought, right, we need to complement that with an app for these people who use these things called apps. And that was when, actually, it was at an SRP conference, or, yeah, an SRP conference where the Open Virtual Worlds group of St Andrews um, was saying, yeah, well, we're, we're, we're quite up for, so this is, you know, it was free. A guy called Alan Miller, I think he's speaking tomorrow, actually. Um, and he was saying, you know, we, we can help you with, with this. We, you know, to pilot it. And we're like, you sure you don't want any money? You sure? I'm like, no, we can do this. Um, so they produced, so w with our content, so we wrote the content. We were quite, because we'd done some training in marketing and stuff, we kind of knew a little bit about content development, did a lot of Googling, got talking to people, developed that. Um, and it's really, I mean, it's simple, really, um, in terms of, it, in, I suppose people might look at it now, if you look at our website, and um, you can then download the app for free um, for Android and uh, Apple devices. And it's, it's basically, really, it, you know, you, you walk our trail, there's not, it's not an interpretive map, well there's a map, but it's not kind of like a virtual, I love a virtual map, um, not a virtual world of it, so you could, but it's just a map and you click on the bits and you get more information and more images and we could put up whatever we wanted on those images um, and on that information and, and it goes around. In terms of um, monitoring it, we haven't. So that's really bad. So that's so what the next question is going to be yeah. in this case of, you've got it, that's fantastic. Yeah. What about uptake? I'm how, openly, how do you report on this? I'm openly admitting to, to that, okay. that, you know, we, um, we also, because we also got this thing called the Global Treasure Map. So if anybody's come across that, um, and that we've got a bit of a partnership going with this organisation, and they did it for free, the first one, um, so that it's free and accessible to anybody. And then they did, we did another one where there's, like, rewards, and so people have to buy it for, like, two quid, um, you can buy this thing. And that's more a bit like geocaching, but virtually. So you can you, 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 you download a kind of quiz trail and you go around and then our local community cafe said you can get a free cake and a coffee if you if you do it right. So that was kind of the reward thing. Um, so and no, was successful. So I said was that successful? How many cakes and coffee went out? Um about twenty so far, but you know, we, we aren't monitoring, you know, and I openly admit to that crapness of what we're doing. I mean, in technical terms. Yeah, crapness. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we, the, 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 so when you get an HLF um, um, fund, you, you complete, I'm a leader, you monitor and monitor and monitor and evaluate for that moment. Um, and we had funding to, to employ somebody to do stuff. But then that finished. This is the thing about project funding. So it still exists. So please download it. Please do it. Um, we do get quite a lot. So we've got a, we've got a Facebook, and we've got seven hundred followers. Says she. I'm so proud of that. Um, and so we get a lot of kind of like debate and interaction on that. I think that the app has like three people saying it's really good. Well, when you're talking about Facebook and that kind of thing, well, I was I was going to say, do you get communities coming to you saying? We know this project is good because we've got so many followers and so many people, so many likes, and, and they're using digital statistics to demonstrate interest. And, and do, you, do you find that that's real interest? And how do you judge strength of interest? I mean, if anybody else has views has on that, because that's something I've definitely seen 
when it comes to, to comes to grant funding. It's like we have this many people, but <coughs> we're very yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. It's okay. Um, I think it would be good if we could join the debate as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so my question on the digital shift is, <coughs> what if your community, mm -hmm. the geographical community, mm -hmm. does not have broadband? Does that okay. Yeah. I think that's. I think that's a very fair question. And I'm. <coughs> please. I think for me. Um, some of the questions we're talking about is about the, the, the need or the purpose of community heritage projects and potential programs. And increasingly, I think it is about our capacity building as part of broader community agendas and um, how you extend you know, what heritage brings and how you can grow audiences and uh, bring community together to issues just such as that. I think it's joining it up. Um, and if there's a way you could have that conversation with the past about the introduction of the telephone. Um, and other modes of communication and then extend that as a future conversation about how the community will be transformed again in a different way by the extension of broadband might be a way. Is it, is it something that, that your community is campaigning for? Yes, it is. <laughs> it's, it's, a big, it's a big deal because uh, it's not just us. If Cairngorm National Park put a lot of effort in something and it fails, even for them, the project has collapsed across the whole of the Cairngorm, so the money is vaporised. So if you can't even manage to do that for rural communities, we've got it in Tom and Tower, we've got infinity there, but if we want to have apps and all sorts of things to see them across the, yeah. all of our area, yeah. we just can't do it and it looks yeah. like it's not coming. Yeah. I think that shows, don't you think that shows the kind of the, the relevance of why cultural heritage is just as one thing in a much, much bigger picture. And so working with community anchor bodies like development trusts and the, and the lobbying kind of development planning issues around broadband Scotland and, and how you influence that. It just shows that it's that we can't stay in our little world of cultural heritage. It's actually a much, much broader issue, you're right, um, a lot of political yeah. stuff. We are both actually in the development trust anyway. Right, yeah. <laughs> and I like the idea of going back into history and looking at other things. But I have to say, I find it a wee bit depressing because I think about how they managed to get about in 1960, they eventually got electricity into Tom and Tower. Oh, yeah. And everyone, all the different organisations worked together and they pushed it through and there was a grand switching on of electricity. And you sort of think with the digital world, we should be that much more skilled up. We have got, we're a richer nation anyway. We've got all the technology. Why is it not happening? I know that's not the question here, yes, I but it impacts on what you're trying to say. It, it does, and I don't disagree. I think there might be a question behind you. Yeah, no, it's really an observation. Um, I think that the comment you made about um, leaflets um, being very popular, uh, I, I suppose the, the, challenge, the challenge I have is that apps can be a bit elitist and you have to have better phones so if you're dealing with people in your community who are disadvantaged you can't afford the like, expensive smartphones mm -hmm. or people have got a very basic phone mm -hmm. they could feel excluded um, so I think that that's a challenge I think the broadband issue is definitely a challenge um, there's parts of my community get 4G and there's parts that can't get any data mm -hmm. um, and you can often um, reach wonderful heritage sites that are very remote and don't have any data signal and of course, I'm, ch I'm charging my phone and my little brick that I've got with me here because the other challenge is that smartphones tend to run out of juice. So if you're using your app a lot and uh, going around the site, you might find that you, your phone dies and actually you might need your phone later on to make a phone call. Um, so that, I suppose, <laughs> that's, that's, that's a challenge. The only thing I would say is that what we've done um, at Keneal is that we've um, made sure our, our, our website is mobile friendly. So that rather than develop apps, which are very expensive to do, um, we just make sure our website is mobile friendly. So if people want to use um, access information on a phone, mm -hmm. you can access yeah. that without having to get an app developed. Yeah. And, and the other thing, last point, is, is that um, really simple things like audio guides, um, which you can download when you're in Wi-Fi zone and then just put them on your phone and walk around the site. Okay. Nice and simple things, download a map, download the audio, walk around the site. I actually don't want to be looking at my phone all the time when I'm in a really good heritage yeah, site because exactly. I want to see the, the heritage around me. Yeah. So I think apps are a bit overplayed a little bit I, for my view. I, I would say that I would agree 
but I would like people to consider that when we're talking about digital, we're talking about all the digital skills. So you need somebody to maybe be able to digitise the audio guide, to be able to make it into something that you can put onto your phone. Again, you need a really good leaflet. It's about, does somebody have the skills to design that? And those are also digital skills. And it's making sure that we have the right range of skills. And I agree. I, I think there is too much emphasis on apps. And I think that there is a, they are fantastic in their own way, but they're not a panacea. Yeah. Can I just interject? And those three others are, yeah, no, my no. can I just interject? Because I think the skill you need there is interpretive planning. And, and it's actually those cross-cutting and transversal skills you were talking about. I think also there are skills simply to be able to extract and understand the underlying information. And uh, we, we recognise in the historic amount of rec records for Scotland that that is not as easy as it should be. And we're working on ways to make it clearer how people use it from the, from the uh, beginner user to a uh, more technical level and also to make the, the, the data more discoverable mm -hmm. so that uh, there's a lot of stuff embedded there if you know where to look for it and we want it to be clear about how you look for it and, and so that enables the information that can then, then go into apps and maps. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take another question from Pebble Jack. It was more an observation on um, sort of the question that you've got there and maybe response on so um, I'm 26 and actually technically I'm not really part of the super digital generation. You know, some of the digital apps that, um, and things that they use like Snapchat a little bit far for me, but I do do a lot of digital communications and I actually provide training to small charity groups who who don't, you know, even realise they probably need to keep contact lists or, you know, for data protection reasons. And I'm, I'm doing quite a lot of work with charity right now. We can't even get to MailChimp yet because we, we need to get here first. Um, and I suppose the one thing that I'd say, in my experience of working in Hess and where I was working in Hess, people are quite a few generations older than me, and I'm sure it's the same in anywhere, is use young people, you know, you're all really active in new volunteers, and, you know, actually maybe they're not very interested in community heritage, but they really know how to use certain types of digital um, apps or programs, or they're really whizzy on design, or they're programming in that sort of school. And you know, that's a way of engaging them in the heritage, is giving them voluntary opportunities to design stuff for you. Um, and I think that's a potentially way of sort of putting two birds upon stone, is if you don't have money to, uh, to pay for someone to train you, or you know, the training program's not enough for you, because they're very often not when you're in a big group. They are great though, and I appreciate it to just come from that. Um, is to maybe think about using volunteering as a creative way of getting more time. Take two, I'll take two more questions. I have to say that the, the fear I had was that there wouldn't be enough questions. <laughs> but, yeah. Hi, I'm just wondering, um, how do you balance between um, moving towards digital shift and trying to engage with certain groups of um, um, societies, minority groups especially, on your projects? Did anybody want to lead on this one? So I could say that that's, that's, where, that's where we're a bit in organisational effort turning down our last application because that was one of the, the reasons of using film. So it was very visual, so it doesn't really matter what, what background you're from. It was the film of the landscape with virtual reconstructions. We felt that was the next step to our project, which was like just opening up to a much, much wider. I know it's a digital audience, but it might be a the tourist audience because you're sitting in your B&B having your whiskey at the end of the day watching the film with a lot so not actually any speaking um, so we were going to get music and and film um, and maybe a couple of people speaking or, or something or maybe not even that so um, maybe film is, is it a good way of reaching but we, we haven't done it yet but. Um, I suppose I'm just I'm going to kind of cross over your questions. The question that you asked about using digital to demonstrate demand mm -hmm. and heritage projects, particularly where there's a new group mm -hmm. coming forward, heritage projects are very often the first things that community groups get involved in through Facebook pages mm -hmm. over that geographic community so that the heritage group in Tory, you know, a huge number of followers, they haven't actually delivered a physical project yet. But what they are demonstrating is there are thousands of people, including the geographic community and the diaspora, that are interested in Tory itself and the history of the place. So 
heritage projects tend to be very good kind of first triggers. You know, you go into miners' welfares across Lanarkshire, and the heritage rooms are always full of people. And that's the local heritage that's not necessarily online, it's just the physical photographs and kind of shared experience. I, I think it's a really good question, and I, I don't think we've got the answer yet, but we're trying to understand um, various groups who, who don't habitually uh, engage with heritage through things like Scotland's Urban Past, where there's a, a specific part of that, a third of all the projects where people are, are groups that don't normally engage. And the purpose of that was to understand how we can engage better with them. And for Scotland's Urban Past, it's a heritage philosophy fund project. Then we relate our experiences to others, whether they're other community groups or other professionals working with community groups. But I, I don't think we've got the answer yet. But we, we definitely have it on our agenda, and we'd love to uh, hear more from uh, anybody who can help <coughs> us uh, do better. <coughs> Who are you going to choose? <laughs> 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 okay, it's a, it's a slightly different, it's going back to the question, I think that there has been a real problem with the digital shift mm -hmm. to community heritage. I've worked, with, I've worked as a freelance with lots of different community groups. Mm -hmm. Funding has driven a demand to place digital into community heritage projects, but sometimes it just isn't the right thing to do. And then you come to the section on your application form to H11, what are you going to do with digital? Naturally, it's not right because you haven't got broadband, you haven't got the demographic that's going to support it. Or with one project I'm re working with recently, there's a huge expectation that when they put their interpretive scheme together, it should include a lot of digital. And we bounced in at that stage, and my very first, first question was, and what's it going to cost you to maintain it? Because they've then got to be sustainable after that. But do you know what? Virtually all the digital has now come out, because the cost of maintaining a smart table, you know, mm -hmm. the expectation is there, and there's this potential sense of failure that you're not keeping up, you're not doing it right, because you're not actually including enough digital. Whereas, you know, it's, it's driven ahead of where broadband, sustainability, the funding environment, the support for community heritage at a central level that says, at the moment what it does is he says, we'll give you money to set up, now you're on your own, go and do it, but we expect you to have this stuff. Mm -hmm. So I think the importance of the digital shift of community heritage is that it's driven it too hard, mm -hmm. and it's not always, always appropriate, it's not always used, it is elitist, you don't have a smartphone and 48% of the population has one, 52% doesn't, so more than half don't at the last count, then actually um, I think we need to rethink what digital actually does. Can I comment on that? Because I think yeah. you're absolutely right, Catherine, I think there's problems of access. I think that's about planning who you're trying to reach and for what purpose. But there are cases where digital is a very good solution because of that, issues of access or the conservation management issues. So I'm thinking of uh, you know, um, what SWAX has done with the Weems Caves and with SCAPE, uh, with 4D Weems, and that was very much because of the problems of conservation and access. And actually the whole process involving the community through the training that SCAPE and others gave to learn ITI and fact content that was produced to form part of the output. So I think there are cases where digital could be most okay, appropriate. It can work. If it works, it works, but if it doesn't, don't turn it into a failure because you haven't got it. Absolutely. I can see that far more people than could possibly expect it to have their hands up right now. With your understanding, I'm going to move on and hope that those questions can come at the end if there's still time, so we can at least have a discussion about a few more questions before we go on. But, so, I, I think we could probably talk about all of these questions for all of the time we say. But, given there were very much glass half full and glass half empty options when it comes to the community buyouts and how communities feel with heritage assets. I mean, Linda, this is obviously something that you've dealt with. I mean, and, and I know this, this is an audience that's talked about heritage skills. I, for me, for communities taking on a heritage asset, it still just comes down to how is this building going to be sustained? If there are particular needs around about its, its head of you, the actual building, then they need to know where they can go and ask and get 
the get the support. And I would be nice to see how they head to schools unless they're very specific projects embedded in the organisation is, is the way forward. I think there's a range of other skills that are more important mm -hmm. to the sustainability of, of facilities than specific heritage um, mm -hmm. skills. Being able to access it mm -hmm. is obviously essential. Mm -hmm. Robin, would you have, have, have views on that to do with the role of the heritage specialist? I certainly think that the uh, underlying knowledge and understanding and said is fundamental mm -hmm. um, and I suppose it ought to be coming out in terms of looking at the significance uh, of the building. It can, could be a, a local significance, it could also be a, a economic or social or environmental, but in terms of heritage significance, um, obviously for something like a, a listed building or a, a historic landscape, then you need to have a thorough understanding of that. And I think there are places that you can go for that either, either by paying for it or by being upskilled by um, some of the people in this room. Uh, and it's only the beginning of your journey now. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the skills involved in running a, a community owned asset are, are significantly onerous. And I think people, in some ways, people need to demonstrate that they are up for that mm -hmm. by upskilling themselves as, as long as there are resources, toolkits, and, and trainers that can help them do that. Just, just um, uh, the use of buyout, which everybody associates with kind of large island buyouts, many of the, the, the big kind of land buyouts, the communities have elected not to take the big house, not to take the large house, because they do not see that as part of their kind of development for for the land and that's been taken on by others, private sector or communities of interest. Mm -hmm. um, so it was just the use of bio there. Yeah, that's that's fair enough. I'm just gonna ask, are there any skills in the room that people have found particularly useful themselves within their communities and, and their, their project? Is is there something that you would want to share that has been far more beneficial than you could have expected. Yeah, it's using sort of community-based mapping or participatory GIS or whatever you want to call it. Um, just in case, for example, in a couple of parks in Wales, we've sort of gone to park users and just say, where do you really go in the park? And don't you know, literally draw out where you go. It's sort of what place is important to you. And, and in terms of park management, you know, what, what needs to be prioritized so that the park staff can or the town Council staff can know where to put more money in, or help spruce up, or that kind of thing, make available or accessible to users. Um, that, that's been really, really interesting. But it's kind of a different way of looking at your own space. Some people just aren't too used to looking at a, a 2D map of their world. I mean, it's all referential, you know, despite Google Maps and everything else. Um, but when you think about what's important to you, like which, where you go or how do you, or in the park, you just walk your dog in the same path. You go up to the top of the hill for the view, uh, in any weather, you know, these kind of things are really, and then you can start to develop really interesting heat maps and all kinds of So just being clear things. about specific knowledge, rather than just the general way people use this. Yeah, because it, you know, you could, do, you could do people counting and all that kind of yeah. thing, space syntax or whatever, but it, it kind of breaks down a little bit. And you say, oh, I use a park, and you just have so many estimates about park usage and that kind of thing. But it, it does translate into heritage and uh, use of the landscape. Sorry, I just had a really specific question. It's not actually about skills at all. Sorry about that. But, um, I, I, I read the um, Community Impairment Act in a small amount, it's not in any depth. But I wondered about the community of interest that you're talking yes. about because I thought the Act was predicated on postcodes and geography. Um, community right to buy is about geography. So the community right, right. to buy have to be a geographic community to exercise any of the community rights by. For the Community Impairment uh, Act um, as a transfer, you can, community of place and community of interest. If you are a community of interest, you have to demonstrate that you are, um, you, you have an open membership and that your membership control your organisation. So if you are a large charity, for example, and your members don't control the organisation, then you would be eligible to ask for a transfer. But if, if you clearly draw your board 
and your management from your membership, which is open, then you, you would be eligible to request asset transfer. Right. So asset transfer, was there something else that commissioned by us that you would have called that, yeah. asset transfer? That is that public assets? That, that's, that's public assets, that yes. asset transfer. But for community interest, I think I'm right in saying that you, you, the, the community in the place has to be up for this as well. Is that right? For for what sorry, for, for um, community asset, asset transfer or public? Yeah. You would be expected to demonstrate that your geographical yeah. community was supportive yeah. of um, your request for a, a public for taking on a public asset. Right. Just I work in an urban authority, so I'm just trying to think about it from an urban perspective as like there, there may be disparate interests in a specific asset that are not even in Scotland. I don't know how that would work, but how that would be demonstrated through any acts. But well, I, think, I think a community, somebody coming in from out of Scotland to ask for public assets would really struggle to justify why we could receive a discounted public asset. Do we have to make a very strong case? Because if you are looking for a public asset to be transferred at a discount, then you're doing so on the basis of the social, economic and environmental benefits your proposal will bring. Um, so, and it's about making that case. So the community of interest, sorry. <laughs> community of interest is, is, it's not geographic. So where would it come from? Could what would be? be? Head injuries group. You, when you actually come into some of the, the um, care, there's, there's a lot of social enterprises, particularly in large urban areas, that are interested in taking on assets. So it could be a women's group, it could be a, kind of any type of such single issue group. Right. Sorry, thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was going to ask myself a question and then answer this. Um, it's probably a different hat on. Um, so, I was involved in writing the asset transfer policy for committee part in my old job, and I think one of the things that we kind of prioritize, that I realised prioritised, and then outside of work, I'm involved in the stage three, fingers crossed, part of the BLF bid, um, on common good land, interestingly, and we have finally got our 25 year lease in that we've got it, so, so pleased. But, I would say actually one of the skills that maybe shouldn't have to be a skill, and it's a shame that it does, is actually just an ability to research and understand what you've got to do. And that's kind of a primary example. Political understanding and confidence. And you know, that kind of happened because our chief executive and our board is very politically active in LEAF, and that's really <coughs> a 25 year LEAF realistically is putting quite sort of pressure. So understanding and confidence and kind of how to exercise your rights. Um, as an individual, knowledge of, of what the government does as well, I think it's called the public body does, I think those kind of skills are actually kind of essential. Okay, whilst you've got the heritage asset, you could talk particularly about, you know, what's the conservation requirements, but actually I'd argue that some of the things you said at the beginning around governance, um, um, budgeting, how to employ people with the right skills, if you get a massive BLF in, you're told to you recruit a heritage officer, you need to understand what sort of skills you want that heritage officer to have beyond what you think, because you're not going to necessarily be the right person to employ them. And you see that a huge amount when you get to grassroots. They don't really know what to do. They think they need this person to do this job, but when it comes to the recruitment, they'll really just hire anyone that they kind of like because they don't really appreciate it. And that's not their fault, and that's why I think it's, it's kind of the skills to understand that. You know, something that has come up several times is people talking about the skills to apply for funding and knowing that that is, is done pretty much very often by, by groups and nobody is being paid for that and nobody, you're just lucky if you get somebody with the right skills to be able to go through the funding process and that's one of the issues that can be very, very difficult. And interestingly, they're not cultural heritage skills. No, exactly. These are generic no. things across the board and that's where I think getting out of the box sometimes you need to see that. But, I mean, that was recognised and the Resourcing Scotland's mm -hmm. Heritage Initiative uh, yes. was there because of that and it was realised that I think that, that needed to be even extended. Yes, um, I think there is understanding around that, although it doesn't net, it, as, as a programme, that is very much related to finding different funds rather than statutory funding. So, despite being funded by HLF, it will not tell you how to fill an HLF form. That is not its purpose, because it appreciates that it, it's to do with where you find additional it's, it, I mean, there's a lot more enterprise skills involved in that, trying to put all the pieces of, of the puzzle together. Yeah, no, I was just going kind of back, 
what both of you said, back to the last question, this question, a lot of it's about wider skills, about planning skills, about thinking something through to the end. And that's very difficult when you've never done something before. And so I think it's back to that peer-to-peer -peer review where you're having a lessons learned approach. You know, um, we can all learn from everybody, all in the panel, but everybody in the room, we've all got different, different things to, to add in. And having the ability, I and mean, I understand that certain projects will do a certain amount of that, and that um, all of these organisations that you're talking about, because I'm um, in one of them, we do provide advice out to people. So it's not that we're here sitting not wanting to provide the advice, but it's maybe like being able to open that up more, and um, and then a kind of obvious like a kind of conference or workshop style environment. Yeah, the partnership approach. It's quite interesting. We are having some real issues around the um, uh, uh, settlement in the um, in Stirling Council area, and we've got Forest Commission, SEPA, SNH. I've got. Yeah, yeah. But you know, and it's just like in the poor communities, going, who do we talk to? How do we talk to them? How do we coordinate their their resources? We know they're all a certain council, obviously. Mm -hmm. How are they all willing to help? They've all got the expertise. It's really difficult, like coordinating their all their different priorities and being able to, yeah, um, like gather them together. And it's this, uh, that this is very much the place based approach thing. And we're trying to go, okay, this is the place. These are all the people sitting in the wings. How do we bring them in to help this place? And it's really, it's, it's not easy. And I think as well, though, there's an element of an organisation cannot tell you what's happening across Scotland at any one time in every community group. So we, we can't actively go out and find every community group to engage. So there's an element there as well about knowing that you can come and talk, you know, that there's an open channel of communication the other way. And that could be done quite simply. Like you said, like a place that you could go and say, here, if I want to talk to NH, uh, <laughs> uh, Hez or SNH, then these people that we can go and start talking to. So that's quite a simple tool, but it could be helpful. And, and from a community perspective as well, as learning journeys are one of the most powerful things that, that we do for groups, actually, is just put them in touch with groups that are doing, have done exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And just the knowledge of the is incredible. Absolutely. I, I'm going to. I'll take one more question. Can we? Yes, go Just, on. Uh, skills should be prioritised. I think a really important one is, is uh, volunteer management and cohesion within the group because um, I'm working with one organisation at the moment where they've got a massive heritage asset to work with and there's an awful lot of essential concentration on wind and water types and everything like this. But also alongside that, they've been wise enough to say, right, that if our volunteers don't hold together, continue to be enthusiastic that actually the whole thing goes to heaven and hand yeah. And so they have got a really good volunteer volunteer coordinator who's holding it together. And they, but it's something that can they're lucky they've got someone who knows how to do it. Mm. But that is something that actually needs a lot of support for yeah. the minute they think about having the acid right through to yeah. yes. people, because otherwise the whole thing goes yeah. yeah. And that takes us on to the last question, which is in some ways the overarching question for for all of, of what we're talking about, the, the importance of, of sustainability. And I think I, I'm going to go with I think most people would agree that when we talk about sustainability, it's about people, place and pounds. This is not just a financial transaction, which of course is what you were saying about volunteers and needing to keep people engaged and involved in the long term in the project. But also when it comes to sustainability, um, it, it's the, the partnerships and how those partnerships deliver because I know that you were talking to me about the landscape initiative and delivering different outcomes for other partners and that's something that can very much help with sustainability of, of heritage projects as well. Yeah, North Light Heritage have been uh, a partner of the main Barry Landscape Partnership Scheme for three years now and uh, a lot of the work we've done across the team over the past few years has been supporting landscape partnerships in different ways. Um, and we've learned through those realities as well. It's not always easy, and, and it has its challenges. We also work with our own groups of volunteers. Some of them are here today, which is fantastic to see. Um, and, and you know, it's a, it is that kind of lessons learned uh, uh, point. I think uh, in terms of sustainability, uh, just an example. Uh, amongst those partners, we have a, a range of other organisations who are focused on other um, sectors or other elements. 
that we work closely with. So one is the Orchards Group, who've been uh, closely involved in regenerating uh, with the Sport for Landscape Partnership for Humanist Fund, as HLF and some of our Scotland as well, you know, the historic orchards and producing apple juice to market for the first time in you know, decades. Um, additionally, there's another social enterprise organisation, CCI, who do wonderful work with user groups who uh, we've worked with together. We're all reaching at the same point with legacy, how do we sustain this? So we're now at the point of further funding, further possible enterprise, and you know what? It never stops. It's an ongoing process. But I think that's the opportunity. It means you have to refresh, you have to keep discussing with people, you have to keep understanding what other people's aspirations and needs are. And I think it really becomes about that ecology, becomes part of that ecology and part of that community in a sense that we can't deliver it individually. We can't deliver it as heritage specialists because actually we're only there to facilitate and enable other outcomes that relate to more to these issues like capacity building or sustainable use of heritage assets, better understanding, skills learning. So there's bigger agendas that by working together, I think we can deliver on multiple outcomes. I I have just wondered, would longer funding cycles make a difference? Sorry, I'm sorry, would longer funding cycles make a difference? Would that make a difference to the communities in the sense of not only building the relationships, but being able to deliver and evaluate on, on longer outcomes? Of yeah, I just sort of I was talking to Gavin about it earlier actually. I think um, we're talking a lot about community heritage community groups, which is absolutely right, but we also need to consider the sort of community support that is propping up a lot of this work or supporting a lot of this work or starting a lot of this work. If you take the HLF out of this question, out of this room, how many of us here would have to still have a job? How many of us here would still be able to do our projects? We are not a resilient um, mm -hmm. subsector of heritage, and we're, it's really worrying mm -hmm. how much we rely on one funder mm -hmm. to continue all the wonderful work that we're all doing. And we really desperately need to start thinking about this, mm -hmm. not only for our projects, but the professionals that are working on these projects with, in partnership with the community groups. We really do need to. Link it to developers. Right. I, I would love to come back because I think there are opportunities for the very process that we've talked about. This, this kind of business planning process of feasibilities and option appraisals, the, you know, the technical process that can have support. I think we face that issue in terms of being entrepreneurial and doing it in a way that's mutual. Um, but you know, this is about taking new products and services to markets, um, but that takes investment to do that. I. I'm just going to add, I think it's also about expressing what you do differently. You do already deliver economic benefits to communities, you, de you deliver social benefits to communities, and it's about expressing that to the right people in the right way, rather than necessarily just focusing on the heritage aspect when you're discussing and, and expressing what, what you do. And I'm not saying that the heritage is not essential and important, but it's just making sure that all the other things you are also delivering are very, very clear to funders and in a, in a wider, in a wider contract. I was just saying that if you're like you, but you or I just saw this morning, you said something really good. I mean, like very interesting that you were creative in the sense of get funding from the SNH, and I have experience as well. My previous job to get funding for a five-year project through the Climate Challenge Fund, which is a completely different. A lot of money again, um, but sometimes it's just a matter of actually tailoring. Being clever enough. <laughs> yeah. It's almost yeah. so much speaking. Being creative. Yeah, there. I remember having a conversation with Heather about that. Yeah, <laughs> sometimes you can find your uh, niche <laughs> in other big pots of funds that you might um, adopt heritage, but through other routes. So mm -hmm. it's just having maybe what I find and what I found as well in the past is groups coming to me and asking me. Why do we find the funding? And it would be very useful to have a library somewhere where people can go because sometimes it doesn't have to be heritage related, it could be something completely different. So, I just on that example, I was at a conference last week down in England and they were talking about a, body, a public body that does exactly that, that actually links people up with alternative funders. Does that exist in Scotland as far as anyone knows? Well, don't the libraries have a network of funds, funds and they keep like a resource? 
A lot of local authorities have like funding alerts. Their CBO has a fun match funding, a funding matching thing. But that's a bit different. That's sort of going, yeah, looking at um, funds you would never normally think about, and it's just being clever. And it sounds like you're spinning it, and that sounds like a negative thing. But it's not. It's just going well. It's the same outcomes. But I remember doing that with Leader and HLF. Exactly the same project, the objectives were different. Mm -hmm. And the outcomes were different, but it's exactly the same project we're doing on nightmare to try and do the claims process for this, both of them, because you're doing completely different things. But it just shows, yeah, it's just about clever. Um, but it takes so much time. I think the third sector interfaces provide um, mm -hmm. you know, fund searching. There's a yeah, there's a national funding search, they give mm -hmm. the township for it. Yeah. But, yeah. but it's also part of I think as you say, it's terminology and structural. Yeah. And we're actually very much more positioned as a sector uh, uh, with things like the archaeology strategy and the historic environment strategy, because they should allow us to key into national performance framework and some of those you know bigger objectives. And I think that's the funding uh, that potentially allows you to deliver to heritage needs, shall we say, but the needs of communities, places, people. Um, and in that respect it's um, uh, you know, these conversations I hope are very useful because if you look at what the uh, natural heritage sector is and develops something like you know, ecosystem services, you know, measuring value in different ways and delivering to these bigger agendas, we still have this debate going about cultural ecosystem services. So that, 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 that sort of sense of you know, we have to set that framework and take that framework to those higher levels. Perhaps partnerships with Valuation Scotland, you know, getting a bit more in there for them to be able to describe. Now, there are lots of questions in the room, but we are genuinely out of time, so I hope everybody can continue those, those discussions. I am just going to ask the panel for one final word each, or a very short phrase, but if there was one skill that you would encourage communities to develop, give me one skill. Well, mine has to be uh, knowledge and understanding. That's fair. Uh, mine is focusing on the enterprise. Uh, mine's audience development. No, you've taken the wrong path. <laughs> <laughs> Graphic design and interpretation. Oh, really? <laughs> okay. um, well, I would, I would like to thank everybody for being involved. Um, I would like to particularly thank the panel for their time and, and their views and their